Okay, so good evening. I hope everybody's doing well. I'm here with Susan Barclay. So we're just going to go ahead and get into it. Hello, uh, Ms. Barclay. How are you doing? Doing well. How about you, Shannon? I'm doing, I'm doing all right. We, 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 uh, we got it right, hopefully this time. So yeah, uh, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk today about, about Guinea. Um, and maybe you could just give us a, give us a rundown of um, some of the history of the country. Yeah, well, before I jump into that, I just want to say, so for all the listeners, I am an anthropologist. And in many ways, I began my career in Guinea doing really long-term cultural immersion and field work. And I was technically a Peace Corps volunteer, but really ended up through following, you know, the local people, ended up in a lot of work that was about social change through the arts. And I just want everyone to know that Guinea is a country in West Africa that's really between Senegal in the north and Sierra Leone to the south of it. And it has about 12 million people four principal regions that are like the maritime region, which is the coastal region with about 20% of the population that identifies as Susu, the middle region, that's the Futajalon, where about 40% of the population lives. And these are the Fulani people. And then Upper Guinea has about 30% of the population. And then the Mandika, Mandika people. Um, and then there's the forest, forested region that has a lot of linguistic and ethnic diversity. Um, there are, are actually 22 different languages that are spoken in Guinea and 50% of the population is under the age of 25. 45% of the population live below the poverty line. And this is a country that has all kinds of different hardships and um, realities that go right alongside so many of their strengths. And they include things like a really low literacy rate with about 40 to 50 percent of the people being literate, a lack of access to education, so much corruption in the past of Guinea, intercommunal violence, um, a lack of health care and civic and political inclusion and a lot of gender inequalities. And then yes, just like you were leading me to, <laughs> Guinea has been facing so many kind of political hardships over its many years now of existence and um, a lot of political instability and a lot of political repression. And that is very much alive and well in the country today. Mm -hmm. Now, um can you tell us a little bit about um, uh, the, the sort of the history of the country as, as far as um, its, its um, ancient past, um, sort of the, the, the empires that were there uh, and things of that nature? Yeah, I mean, this is something I feel like a lot of US American audiences don't get to hear that much about because of a very Eurocentric focus in terms of what people learn in the States, a lot of people, if they go back in terms of, um, you know, the history of civilizations, it's often only to Egypt. But Guinea was part of many West African empires that flourished for centuries, including the Ghana Empire, the Soso Empire, the Mali Empire, the Songhai Empire. Um, and when those empires fell, many kingdoms existed. And the most contemporary last empire was the Wasalu Empire in Guinea, which was from 1878 to 1898. And that was led by a gentleman named Samurai Toure. And he actually was one of the key figures in really mobilizing and resisting French colonial rule. And the French did successfully conquer that empire and also captured him. And the French and the British and the Portuguese in the 19th and 20th centuries then actually divided and actually created the countries that we see today on a map um, in West Africa. And so Guinea was part of that. And um, the French then maintained their colonial rule um, until like the 1950s. And they were facing a lot of 
opposition and many uprisings and a lot of pushback in a lot of their co colonies at the time, including in Algeria and a lot of problems in um, Vietnam and Laos and um, Cambodia. And actually the fourth Republic in France collapsed. And in 1958, uh, Charles de Gaulle came in and created the fifth um, Republic in France with the support of the French people. And as part of that, he actually gave the colonies a choice between more autonomy, but maintaining their connections and their, you know, really being part of still the, the larger French community or else getting their immediate independence. And every single colony decided that they would stay with the French and Guinea was the only country that actually opted to get their independence. And Sekou Toure, who became the first president then of Guinea in 1958, was at the head of this. Um, and what he said to Charles de Gaulle was that direct quote here, we have told you bluntly, Mr. President, what the demands of the people are. We have one prime and essential need, our dignity. But there is no dignity without freedom. We prefer freedom in poverty to opulence in slavery. And needless to say, this did not go over well with the French. Um, this really was a, a, an extreme pushback. And, and most countries in Africa really do know Guinea as this country that took the stand and became the first uh, former French colony to say, we want out. And the Washington Post and many other people have reported on how um, horrific the French response was. And a direct quote from the Washington Post is, in reaction and as a warning to other French speaking territories, the French pulled out of Guinea over a two month period, taking everything they could with them. They unscrewed light bulbs, removed plans for sewage pipelines in Conakry, the capital, and even burned medicines rather than leaving, with, leaving them with the Guineans. And that is the story that Ghanaians tell. They literally say like the French took every last piece of railroad with them when they left. And um, it did set up a lot of hardships for that country after the French left. Um, and yet people remain incredibly proud that Guinea was this country that actually said, no, we don't want to continue as a French colony. We want our independence. Right, right. And how did other countries respond to, to Guinea's um, sort of resistance and call for independence, say with like a, with the United States, right? I know like when Haiti uh, fought for independence in the 18th century, yes. uh, the United States sided with France and basically di didn't recognize them as a state, right? And so was this sort of the same, same response with the United States um, uh, when, when, when Guinea decided to be, become an independent nation? Well, it did definitely isolate them in many ways. And right. um, their kind of initial response by Sekou Toure and the Guineans was to actually align themselves with what was the Soviet Union um, and try to find some kind of ways that they could have um, you know, international support. So mm -hmm. it was through the Soviets at the time and also um, really kind of leaning towards more socialist policies and kind of um, a Chinese model. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the United States did give, continue to give some investments as far as I know. And um, it really meant that the Ghanaians found themselves very much on their own in, in many ways. And um, it is very widely respected, definitely, as the choice and, and as the path. And there's a lot of pride in taking that path. Mm -hmm. But it also meant that economically, Guinea was in a real hardship. And right. um, they had a lot of strain in terms of kind of the next many, many years. Right. And Sekou Toure, who came in as this really revered character who had you know stood his ground against colonial powers he became increasingly authoritarian and really 
by like even two years later had banned every other political party except his political party. He went on to not only do so many arbitrary arrests, um, he went on to do mass killings, um, to do so much political repression and to really be a very corrupt figure. And he passed away then in 1984. And Within a very short period of time, there is a coup by Lozana Conte, who comes in in 1984, um, and he is the second then very authoritarian leader. He comes in with this kind of, at this point, I would say almost routine um, message for new leaders in Guinea, sadly, that he's going to start, you know, in being much more open in terms of politics and respect human rights. He does release many political prisoners, encourages a lot of people to come back from exile, and it takes him also a short period of time to start really being much more someone who's corrupt, practicing favoritism, rounding up anyone who speaks out against him, and he's in power from 1984 until 2008 when he passed away, and at that point in time, the army captain Kamara comes in, seizes power in another coup wow. and huge protests take place in 2009. There's been many, many, a very long history of all kinds of political protests in Guinea by all kinds of different people across, um, you know, genders, across politics, um, against this kind of corruption. and. Those opposition protests in 2009 took place at a stadium. They're very well documented. And um, the military basically came in and, and killed 157 people and even used rape as a widespread tool of um, political violence. And Kamara was then subsequently shot actually in 2009 by one of his aides. He went to Morocco for aid and that brought about a return, or let's not say a return, for the first time, a transition to civilian rule. Mm. And that took place in 2010, when the first democratically democratic elections took place. That's after 50 years or so of really author authoritarian rule. Right. And that was between Alpha Conde and Selu Jalo. And the election results were basically that Alpha Conde took that um, those elections, which were seen as relatively smooth and fair, um, by 52%. And uh, Jalo got 47% of the vote. And so Alpha Conde was in power then from 2010 until just last September 2021, when the latest coup in Guinea took place by a gentleman named Mamadi Dumbuya. Um, and he basically was someone who was brought in in 2018 by Alpha Conde to lead the special forces and is someone who was trained by US um, Green Berets. And he was actually in training by them. He took a break from training and went in September of um, 2021 and took out um, Alpha Conde who had already become a contested leader by trying to actually changed the Ghanaian constitution to allow him to have a third term. He was 83 years old and um, moving towards this third term and changing the constitution, which many Ghanaians felt like was another form of corruption. And so while people were very much against him, they were not necessarily in favor of another coup. And Mamadi Dumbuya is still in power right now. Um, and um, is someone who was, as I said, trained by U.S. Um, Green Berets, is someone who was also in the French Foreign Legion and um, came in in September 2021, promising, again, all these changes in Guinea. And people were very, very hopeful. And the economic community of West African states actually gave him until April 25th of 2022 to make a change and a transition for constitutional democracy and not constitutional democracy again. And he just came out on May 3rd of 2022 saying he is proposing a three year or 39 month plan to return to civilian rule. Okay. So people are really wondering what 
is actually going to happen in Guinea and whether you know, going back to constitutional democracy and civilian rule is going to happen or whether Dumbuya will be another person that comes in saying that they have really good intentions, that everything's going to go back to more political freedoms and human rights, et cetera, and that will this pan out or not is a big question that many Ghanaians are really wondering about today. Right. Now, now when you say Dumbuya took out, right, are you, are you saying that he um, he killed the former no, he okay. didn't kill him. He was imprisoned. Actually, he was just released in, I can't remember now if it was April or May from um, prison, but no, put on house arrest, okay. detained, and then just recently released, but taken out from power. So no longer, yeah, the president of Guinea. Okay. And, and um, I remember the last time we talked, uh, you had mentioned, you know, the, the U.S. involvement in uh, in Guinea, and sort of broadly, like uh, generally the, the Western part of Africa in general. Um, so can we can we talk a little more about that? Like, what what has been sort of the policies um, of the U.S. towards uh, countries like Guinea? Yeah, well, this is such an important part of you know, what I wish more U.S. Americans knew about. And here I'm really going off of Nick Turner's reporting of The Intercept and looking at since 2008, well, let's go back even farther than that. You know, 2001, September um, 11th happens and these terrorist attacks. And then from that point on, the United States is investing billions of dollars up until the present in all kinds of counterterrorism efforts. And a lot of those have been actually taking place in Africa. And my Ghanaian friends would tell me all the time that from their perspective, Africa is the forgotten continent. The fact that we're dealing with 54 different countries and so many different cultures and communities, and that so many people in the States literally just say Africa, like it's one monolithic entity and it betrays how little connection and knowledge we have about this area. Um, and so the United States and US taxpayer dollars have been funneled into these many, many, many countries and communities since 2001 in countless ways and really coming in our military through Africa Command or AFRICOM. And um, since 2008, US trained officers. So these are people who are being trained by the United States and have actually had conducted many, many coups and many successful coups. And they've taken place in so many West African countries, including Burkina Faso, Mali has had three of them, Mauritania, the Gambia, Guinea being you know, a recent example, but in the last year alone, people who have been trained by United States Special Forces or our military. Um, Mali had a coup in May 2021. Chad had a coup in April and May 2021. Burkina Faso, tw January 2022. Niger had a failed coup attempt right before their inaugurations in March 2021. And Guinea in September 2021. Um, so a lot, a lot of money has been poured into the training of a lot of these people in efforts that are supposed to be counterterrorism efforts. And that means that the United States is sending in all kinds of special forces and small teams of commandos that are there to train and advise and assist and occasionally even accompany into battle um, local forces. And they technically and officially definitely say that their interest is not in any way to have the efforts that are going into these countries end up in creating coups or, the, you know, having these kinds of realities. But so many people on the ground in many of these countries feel like ultimately a lot of these efforts have led to greater destabilization of their communities and their countries rather than increased security. Right. Um, so it is, a, it's a very contentious reality and something I think 
everyone should be following a little more closely. Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to do my part to follow what's been going on. But I wonder what what is the response by the local people um, to a lot of these sort of what seem to be sort of out of their hands or, or they, they, you know, they don't have, it seems like they don't really have any, any, in, the ability to uh, fight for themselves, which I know is not true. Um, yeah. But, yeah. How no, but you're resonating, I think, with what a lot of Ghanaians would say. I mean, a lot of times those larger structures that are in place, I mean, you know, the United States, I feel like for so many people is just like, whoa, hands off um, <laughs> for Ghanaian folks, it, but let alone just their own political, um, their politicians and the cycles that they have risked their lives and protested and stood up to corruption and political repression and felt like not a lot really comes out of it because of those structures being so powerful. Right. And I think that people are right now just very hesitant, kind of holding their breaths in terms of seeing what is going to happen with Dumboya and can he ultimately, as someone who is actually trained in France, married to a French national, um, will he hold any of those values that we give so much lip service to um, really in the high regard? that they, they mean to so many people around the world. Like, is democracy something that really counts and can it count in a concrete way for Ghanaian people on the ground? Um, and is equality and is inclusion and all of these kinds of really important freedom and um, you know having those rights and responsibilities, are they gonna pan out or not? And people continue to protest and to risk their lives. And I think also right alongside that, I think a lot of what I saw and what I continue to see in Guinea is that people really have so much that they are fighting for in their daily lives that they are struggling just to survive. And that really is much more about a local level of people being so much about interdependence and community and family and friends first. And like, you never let anyone in your close knit circle go and you're caring for them and you're watching them. And, and people in Guinea totally taught me this, which was just so beautiful. I mean, I had friends sit me down after a couple of months and say, Susan, we just need to tell you what the real meaning of a friend is here. Like we do not set up an appointment or like a date for coffee. <laughs> like we are with each other in this day and night and like whatever you need, whatever you're going through, we have your back. Yes. And I think that's something that like people are fighting with these kind of local strategies that may not be just about when they're going to protest if an unjust referendum is being proposed, but they are protesting with their humor, they are protesting with their arts, they are protesting with the way they tease each other, with the way they greet each other, with the way that they will never, ever, ever let you out of your their sights if you are their friend or you are in their community. Um, and so although political agency may not be particularly strong in Guinea in many ways, while practiced on a regular basis, the social wealth in Guinea is absolutely inspiring and mind blowing. And it is what gets people through. It is that kind of community and definitely all the things like music and dance and theater that help people to fill themselves up enough to get fueled for another day of having to you know find their way and and have that energy to be able to say yes we can do this and we will find a way to keep going right well i i um i, I remember you saying that uh you know you worked on um you know uh like peace projects uh through art and and things of that nature could you tell me about some of the um projects you worked on with the community there? Yeah, I mean, it was amazing because one, I'm officially there as a Peace Corps volunteer. So I was teaching English was my job. And so I had to, you know, go down to the high school and teach there. Um, 
a couple of times, like about, I think I was doing like 12 or 13 hours a week, 15 hours a week in the classroom. But it didn't take me very long to become close to my students. And so a couple of different things happened kind of around the same period of time, about four or five months in when I was really becoming fluent. I lived in the Putajalons, so the middle region of the country, becoming fluent in Pular. And yeah. around that same period of time, I had students from my like um, 13th year, it's a French system, so the terminal year, come up to my house and say miss you know we want you to spend a little time with us um will you help us translate these lyrics from rap and hip-hop into english and so it was like pooler was in there and french was in there and we're english we're all starting to work together and then i started getting invited to some of the amazing music scene um you know, concerts and things that were going on through that. So I'm seeing, wow, music is such a vibrant part of this community. And so many young people are speaking their truths through music. And in a context of such political repression, where so much is literally like you at the time critiqued um, Lizana Conte in the newspaper, all those newspapers were shut down, confiscated, burned, like you never saw them. But music was this realm where incredible critiques were coming out. And so I was really interested and started getting into that. And, and then the other part was just being in the classroom, trying to teach this government curriculum of English and no one was at all engaged. And I was trying my best like, okay, so what's gonna work? I mean, I was critiquing the government curriculum that was teaching the present progressive, which is what we use all the time to say, what are you doing? How are you, you know, how, what are you doing? What are you, you know, up to all that kind of to be an ING, a verb in IMG. Um, so we use this all the time. I'm going to the market, I'm doing this, I'm listening to music, I'm watching TV. That was taught in the second year. So I was really starting to say, okay, this is not conversational. And at the same time in my classroom, I found that people did not want to do so many of the exercises I was proposing. <laughs> but as soon as I literally said, does anyone want to do a skit or a role play? All of a sudden, my entire class so like raised their hands. I was like, okay, this is so different from the States. Like if I had right. students here to do a role play, oh my goodness, like talk about <laughs> uncomfortability. No one's, no one's going to do it. They're like, Susan Barclay, what are you trying to make us do? <laughs> All of a sudden, and I'm like, okay, well, this is so interesting. And so it really kind of led me to like see how much people are into theater and role playing and that got me really interested in in kind of theater as another vehicle of social change and almost every culture has its arts that kind of are the ones that have the most currency and in guinea they have so many i mean music dance theater and so that was just a beautiful avenue on to really you know working with a lot of my local community to figure out how to address the lack of girls education through mm -hmm. theater Okay. And, um, and so that ended up being something that really grew as, as a, right alongside my, you know, capacities basically to use my U.S. American, um, uh, basically your Peace Corps stipends. So these U.S. taxpayer dollars, my Peace Corps stipend went into a lot of studio time and a lot of yeah. supporting of rap and hip hop music. And then the U.S. Embassy gave us a grant to develop with Ghanaian artists and with the input of so many local Ghanaian girls and women, a play that then toured the country that was all about the, the hardships that young girls face in going to school and staying in school. And um, and I just was amazed in doing that tour with Ghanaian actors and just seeing how people in the community came out no matter where we went. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the arts are such powerful vehicles to communicate so many messages, especially in context where people don't necessarily have high literacy rates. Mm -hmm. So when you're acting out someone, something or you're playing music or you're dancing it out, well, you don't need to read French or you know have a literacy rate that's, that's more than 50% because 100% of your audience can understand what's being conveyed. Exactly. <laughs> that makes sense. I wonder if there's any um, like form of satire with the, with, with the, with the, with the plays and 
um, acting in the music? Do they kind of uh, say things about the government sort of? Oh sort yeah. Of that they can't really understand. You know what I mean? It's kind of like hidden message or something. Oh like yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, that's something I feel like is holding, you know, kind of held in the balance right now is what's going to happen with human rights and political expression under Dumbuya. Um, but at the time, I mean, absolutely, I was just amazed. I would listen to lyrics or so many of these messages, just like what you're saying, were much more implicit messages or critiques. They didn't have to be explicit at all, but people in the community understood them. And then even things like hearing in music, people say, you know, like, where is the rest of the planet in even thinking about people in Guinea as human beings? You know, what about the situation of so many women and girls in Guinea? Uh, what about the corruption in the government? They were saying these kinds of things that you would probably be arrested for generally at the time. And yet the music, the theater, was really getting this kind of stuff out there. And it, it was just amazing to see. And it, it continues to be a really vibrant part of Guinea. There's such a, a beautiful arts community. And I do also go back to what I said, it helps people get through and survive and be able to say, look, life is got some value. We can you know, laugh together, we can dance together, we can sing together. And that kind of connection and community is just so fulfilling and uplifting on a very, very deep level. Yes. Um, and so, yes, definitely. I mean, I think that is a really just amazing part of, of what is going on in Guinea still. And also that a lot of those realms can kind of go around then some of the more formal, if you you know, happened to be in any part of government and said the same thing, you would probably face very extreme consequences. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's amazing. I, I remember yeah. I wanted to uh, <clears throat> be a part of, I wanted to join Peace Corps for some of the uh, similar reasons. Um, but uh, I, I know um, that Guinea is, is a, uh, is a majority Muslim country, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, right? yes, it is. And, yeah, uh, about 85% yeah. of people there identify as Muslim. And one of the things that really, you know, I had spent time before going there in the Middle East. And I think a lot of people in the States kind of have this idea that everyone who's Muslim is somehow ideologically motivated, despite the fact that we have many Christians in this country who are very ideologically motivated. And in Guinea, people are really, and like many other parts of the world, they're culturally very motivated. And so Islam is part of a tradition for them. It's part of a community for them. Um, and it just warmed my heart, you know, being someone who cared so much about adapting to my local circumstances and living with the people and being with them. So I fasted for both my years, the whole month of Ramadan, because people welcomed me so warmly into that circle. They didn't say, you're not a Muslim, you can't do this with us. And people did the exact same thing with prayer, literally like, hey, come, like, let's show you how you do this. Just as I, you know, know many people around the world would say, please come into this Hindu temple or come to this church or let me show you what I do and let me share this with you because it's an important part of what's meaningful to me, but I'm never going to try to tell you this is the right way, the only way, and I'm certainly not going to tell you you have to be like me. I just want to share me with you. Right. And um, so that was just a really beautiful part. I mean, I I prayed with people, I fasted with people, um, and, and, you know, learned a lot by their sides, and yet no one ever told me, you know, you're not a believer, you're, you know, not good because of this, you're not right. None of that language, none of that ideologically polarizing and divisive uh, standpoint existed at all. It was literally this warmth and 
um, people love like every time I told them in Pular, I'm fasting. They're like, are you kidding me? (laughs) You're not fasting. I'm like, yes, I am. You're all fasting. So I'm fasting with you. And they just loved it. And then breaking fast with them, you know, every night over that month of Ramadan, um, it was just such a beautiful experience of being invited to so many people's homes to break fast and so many people caring about me and sending me home with food. And that's a huge part of Ghanaian culture is sharing food and taking care of all those people close to you. Um, and I know um, that you also, you know, care about and follow just like Ramadan. So that happened from April 1st to May 1st, 2022. It's always changing because of the lunar cycle. Yes. But um, in Guinea, it's just an incredible experience because you know, one of the pillars of Islam is almsgiving or zakat, which is like giving about 2.5% of your income to charity. And in Guinea, people don't have a lot of cash that they can give, like making donations or literally, you know, saying I'll, I'll, I'll make this contribution financially is almost impossible for most families. But what is the most amazing, beautiful thing that I saw every single night through the whole month of Ramadan, it's not just towards the end, it's the whole month of Ramadan. You literally wanna watch relationships, just watch the food go across the night skies or the evening skies. So families always make extra food. I mean, once you break fast, this is you know, the best holiday food and you're having such a great time together, but you never forget those lesser than you. And you never ever, you know, forget to give back. And so literally I would watch from 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m. It's all these young people in their families who are carrying now plateaus on their heads, crossing with all these bowls of rice and sauce and all these different things to people in need. And so people give back through the entire month of Ramadan and they give back by giving extra meals, by giving holiday treats, by giving the most festive food to all these other people in their community who need it. And seeing that again, is just an incredible fabric of holding us all together socially when so many other things in our life are really, really tough. Wow. Sounds Sounds like we could learn a lesson here. I know. I so agree. I so agree. I know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to get my family together. Like, all right, all right. Let's, let's have a feast. Let's have a meal. Yeah. Exactly. And let's not forget those other people who maybe just need that little bit of extra love, that little right. bit of extra care, that little right. bit of, you know, I mean, I think that is such a big part of humankind. It's just... When other people say, I've got your back, and they don't just say it with lip service, but they show up with a meal, or they show up when you're lonely, or they show up because you're going through a hard time, and they're like, we are here for you. The Ghanaians really, by and large, have this down. And there's a lot of other things that are not working and that are really, really tough. But my goodness, that inspired me just so much. And I completely agree with you, Shannon, like imagining bringing that home more to the United States where we are just facing, you know, more political divisions than ever and more dehumanization between people who identify as U.S. Americans. And that if there could be more actually food sharing and more like, you know, I bet you're going through a rough time and I'm going through a rough time or I went through a rough time, like we all can connect. Right. on some of these really basic human realities. Right. And that might just be what keeps us living tomorrow. I totally agree with you. That is just yes. the heart of the matter. Well, you know, you, you, you've, uh, you've, you've, I, I hope that I've helped shed some light um, or both of us have shed some light on, on Guinea. Uh, I'm going to keep uh, my eyes open and, keep paying attention to what's what's going on in the country um me too and um you know i really i really hope hope this does some good uh and 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 gives people much more information and knowledge so i want to thank you for joining me uh uh again and um i i hope we can do this again we can talk about something else if you want to I love it. Yeah, it's been seriously my my pleasure. And I just a huge shout out to all those folks in Getty who 
who are living, who are striving, who are thriving, who are making it day by day, and literally who taught me so, so much and who I carry with me in my heart every day and continue to inspire me. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I'll talk to you later, Vian. Sounds great, Shannon. Take care. <laughs> okay, you too.